In the old chapter, just Jude, to verse 3. One verse of scripture, and we can read it off the screen. Just follow up with me as I read it. It says, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend, if you're taking notes, underline that word contend, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once all delivered to the saints. Can we bow our heads as I pray? Father, in the name of Jesus, I just want to thank you for every person that's come out this evening, Lord. Father, everyone who's braved the bad weather, Lord, Father, we just thank you for their lives. And Father, I pray that there would be a blessing upon their lives as a result of their attendance tonight. Lord, I pray that you would help them in their finances. Lord, I pray there would be an increase in their wisdom, in their knowledge, in their ability to make money and as well as to manage money. Father, I pray, help us to be good ministers of what you've put into our hands. Father, I pray a spiritual blessing upon your congregation. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. I want to speak to you about Christians that fight. Christians that fight. See, many people have a wrong idea of what it means to be a Christian. I wonder today if you would raise your hand if this has ever happened to you. How many times have you ever behaved in such a way and someone said to you, Oh, uh, that's not the way Christians should behave. Has that ever happened to you before? All right, okay. Uh, most of us. And the truth is, there is a difference between people's perception and the reality that's shown to us through scripture as to what it means to be a Christian. Some people think Christianity is a faith movement for weak people. That if you're a Christian, it means you're weak, it means you're soft, it means you wear the sandals. And I don't like to use this phrase, this is what they call them, they call them Jesus sandals. How many of you know what I'm talking about? They're the straps of leather. If you're a Christian, you walk around wearing shorts, you wear Jesus sandals, uh, you, maybe you eat vegetables all the time, uh, maybe, you are, you're, maybe you're a tree hugger, uh, and maybe you sing around the campfire, Kumbaya my Lord, Kumbaya. And there is this perception of Christianity that the world has, which is one of something that is insipid, weak, timid, yeah. and something that is shy and backward forming. They think that being a Christian, it means that you are never upset, you, you never get angry at anything. They have no idea about righteous anger, they have no idea about righteous indignation. And I often have to remind people that the same God who created heaven also created hell. Come on, some of you got a round of applause for that. You know, see, we like the God of heaven, we just don't like the God of hell. Yes. Alright, we, we, we like this side of God, we like this side of Christianity, we like the good works, the charitable deeds, we like the love, the kindness, the softness, and all that, but we don't like the, the, the fiery sword. We don't like uh, Jesus talking about, I didn't come to bring peace, I came to uh, bring a sword, I came to set a, a man against uh, a woman, etc., etc. We don't want to hear about wars and fighting and etc., etc. But when you read the Bible, you cannot escape the amount of fighting and battles that take place in the Word of God. We read about the book of Exodus, and this is the overarching narrative, this is the overarching story of the new, of the Old Testament, rather. It's about how Joseph was sold into slavery, you guys know the story, by his brothers. He rose up to become the second most powerful person in Egypt, and that was the beginning of the Jewish people being in Egypt. Uh, over a period of time, because of their might, because of their number, uh, Pharaoh enslaved the people of God and they were enslaved for many years until God rose up a deliverer by the name of Moses. Moses, who was raised in uh, this city called Ramesses, who was, uh, uh, who was raised in Pharaoh's house, uh, who was, uh, uh, he knew their customs, but he was really a Hebrew. He rose up, uh, God called him, God uh, gave him an assignment, he went to Pharaoh, let my people go. Right. Ten times God tested Pharaoh's heart. Ten times uh, God began to deal with Pharaoh. And uh, you know the story. Eventually they leave. Uh, and uh, as they leave, they're headed towards the, uh, the Red Sea. And Pharaoh changes his mind after ten times. And he comes after the people of God. But he's coming with an army. Yeah. He's not coming to, uh, uh, to play football. He's not coming to play games. He's chasing after the people of God with an army. They've got chariots, they've got horses, they've got swords, spears, shields, uh, bow and arrow. They're coming to uh, do damage. And you know the story that God calls the Red Sea to part because Moses lifted up the staff, which represent the power of God in his hand. Uh, but the sea parted, they walked across some dry land, and as the enemy from their past, as their past life came after them, 
them. And how many people know when God's trying to take you something, your past tries to come after you? Yeah. Somebody say amen to that, alright? And so their past is coming after them, and as the Egyptians begin to cross over, God causes the sea to come back together, and they're washed away. What a very powerful picture of baptism. Mm. Baptism washes away your past. Baptism washes away your old life. It's a symbol, it's a picture of you entering into your new life. And so sure enough, we see that story. We see Joshua uh, chapter 6, uh, uh, amen, where God tells uh, the people of God to uh, defeat the, uh, uh, the city of Jericho. Do you remember singing songs about Jericho? Jericho, tear down the walls of Jericho. See, when I got saved, a lot of the songs we sang in worship were military songs. They were fighting songs. They were, they were defeating the enemy songs. They were songs of battling. They were songs of fighting. And so sure enough, the people of God have to march around the city of Jericho. Jericho shut up. It's tightly uh, formed. Uh, no one can get in. No one can get out. The children of Israel cannot defeat it. God tells them march around once. Every day for six days. And on the seventh day, with seven priests, with seven ram's horns, you're going to make a loud shout. You're going to blast a long blast from the um, ram's horn. Make a loud shout. You're going to march around seven times on the seventh day. And sure enough, they did that. And the walls came tumbling down. And the children of Israel are rushed into the uh, city of Jericho. And they defeated Jericho. You see, you can't read the Bible without reading them about fighting and wars. Yes, yes. And this is totally at odds with the attitude and the mindset people have of Christianity. You can go on, the next uh, chapter is Joshua, chapter 7, the battle of Ai, etc, etc. How they defeat, actually they were defeated by Ai because Achan had sinned and he had disobeyed God. But the point I'm simply trying to make is that when you read the Bible, you read about God's people constantly having to fight in order to defeat their enemies. Yeah. You see, the reality of what I'm trying to say to you today is that Christianity requires us to fight, to be assertive, and to be aggressive. That if you're going to make it as a Christian, you can't be a namby pamby, a little whimsy, yeah, whatever that might be, amen, I don't know what I did that for, uh, amen, but you've got to be aggressive, you've got to be assertive, you've got to be determined, you've got to be prepared to fight. Our text today says that I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation. I found it necessary to write to exhorting you or encouraging you to contend earnestly. If you, uh, if you underline that word, that word contend, it means to argue with. It means to fight, you know, in boxing terms. When you're the champion and someone wants to fight you, the opponent that wants to fight you is known as the contender. They're contending for the championship. They're contending for the belt. It means they're fighting. And so the message translation says, Dear friends, I dropped everything to write to you about this life of salvation that we have in common. I have to write insisting, begging that you fight. Someone say fight. That you fight with everything you have in you for this faith entrusted to us as a gift to God and church. And so here is, a, a, here is Jude writing to us, the book of Jude, and he says, as believers, you've got to fight. Yeah. You've got to fight. You can't be passive. Yeah. You can't be easygoing. You can't be laid back as a Christian. You can't be kumbaya, my Lord. You can't take it easy. You've got to be on your toes. How many people have ever, ever had a physical fight? All right, maybe that's the problem. Some of you let me try it. How many of you have ever had a physical fight with punches and kicking? No, I'm not talking about argument. How many of you have ever had a physical fight? My goodness. Oh, wow. Man, I can't tell you how many fights I've had. Wait, wait, don't worry about that. Hey, listen, when someone wants to fight, you better be on your toes. You know, I see these guys with their hands down. Come on then, come on then. I'm like, bro, you better put those hands up. How many of you have seen those videos of people getting beaten up? On social media, you know, two guys get into a fight. You better put your hands up, you better bubble weave, you better duck and dive, you better throw some punches, you better move on your feet. You can't be passive. You can't be laid back. And it's that sort of mindset we need to have when it comes to our faith, when it comes to the promises of God. If you and I are going to become and to receive everything that God wants us to be and to have everything God has for us, you're going to have to be aggressive. You're going to have to learn how to fight. First yeah. Timothy chapter 6 verse 2. Paul writes to Timothy, he says, Fight the good fight for the true faith. 
hold tight to the eternal life which God has called you, which you have declared so well before many witnesses. And the advice, the pastoral advice given to this young pastor, you've got to fight the good fight. You've got to learn how to fight. That word fight, it means to take part in a violent struggle. It means to struggle to overcome. It means to strive to do or achieve something. It means to move forward with difficulty. Matthew chapter 11 verse 12. Listen to the words of Jesus. From the days of John the Baptist, the kingdom of God suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. And we might not always know exactly what that verse means, but it does mean that fighting and violence is a part of the Christian life. That the kingdom of heaven involves spiritual violence. And if you're going to break from finances, you are going to have to fight to obey the word of God. You are going to have to be aggressive in your faith. You're going to have to contain. You're going to have to strive. You're going to have to fight for the things of God if they're going to happen. If you want to move forward in your finances, you're going to have to fight for it. It's not automatic. It's not because you prayed the prayer. It's not because you mentally decided you're going to do something. No, it's not just because the promises of God are written there, even though we know the promises of God are yes and amen. No, you're going to have to fight for it. See, kingdom blessings must be seized. Have you ever had a card put through your letterbox by the postman or delivery guy saying, we have a package for you? And it couldn't fit through the letter box, so no one was in, you've got to come and collect it. And here's a package, it has your name on it. It has your address on it. But you know what you've got to do? You've got to go collect it. <laughs> you've got to go and pick it up. And this is how it is in the kingdom of God. There are things that God has for every single one of us. It has your name on it. It has your address on it. But you must collect it by faith. By faith you've got to go and get it and apply it to your life. It's true of healing. How many people know Jesus heals? How many people know healing is a promise for God's children? But just because the Bible says you shall be healed, doesn't mean say you're going to be healed. You've got to contend for it. You've got to fight for it. You've got to say, I know what God's word says. And I activate my faith. I've got aggressive faith. I walk by faith and not by sight. I'm going to put my faith to work. I'm going to activate my faith. I'm going to apply my faith. The reason why so many believers don't get what God has for them is because their faith is not aggressive enough. They're passive. They have mild faith, they have lukewarm faith, they have timid faith, they have uh, insecure faith. And unless we learn to be aggressive in our faith, we won't get all that God has for us. You see, this is where so many people fail financially. See, if you're going to receive the promises of God, you know what it means you've got to do? You've got to be aggressive in your decision to have financial faith. Yeah. So many times people come to church in the atmosphere of worship. In the atmosphere of the word, people say, yes, I hear the Bible, I see the scriptures on the screen, I see the scriptures, I agree with everything up you say, then they walk out there and they change their mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They walk out there and their car breaks down. Ah, oh, next time. Uh, how many of us have wanted to start a diet tomorrow? How many of us have wanted to join the gym next week, next month? Soon come. You know, we put it off and what happens, you get into a pattern of that and it becomes so easy for you to make a decision in the house of God and within minutes you've changed your mind or you know in your heart you're not going to see it through because your faith has become timid, your faith has become weak, your faith has become passive. It says fight the good fight. you got to fight for your salvation. How many people know the devil sometimes will cause you to doubt your salvation? Sometimes the devil will call. You ever had a thought that God may not even be real? You ever had some weird thoughts come into your mind? Well, what do you do with those thoughts? Well, if you were passive and lazy, you just allow those thoughts to linger. But if you have aggressive faith, if you have active faith, you say, I rebuke that thought in Jesus' name. Because we know that the enemy fires fiery darts, these fiery arrows, into our minds and inflames our minds and deposits all sorts of negative thoughts into our minds. Just today I had a phone call from a Christian brother who was struggling on his job and he's calling me up and says, Pastor, yeah man, I've been problems with my job, some guy's giving me a hard time and I want to do him something. I want to do him something. 
And I listened to the brother and said, yeah, yeah, I understand that. I understand we're flesh. We're made of flesh, but also made of spirit. I said, you know what? You've got to fight, bro. Yes, amen. Not physically, but you've got to fight to forgive this person. You've got to fight to work with them. Yes. You've got to learn to love them. You've got to care for them. They need Jesus, bro. You see, does everyone understand what I'm saying? There's so many things that happen to us in life. And if we're going to live the Christian life, we've got to be active in activating our faith. We've got to have aggressive faith. See, the kingdom, the blessings of the kingdom must be seized. You can't be walking around, oh, well, if it comes my way, it comes my way. How many times have I prayed for people and they had pain? And when I pe and I prayed for them, I asked them, where's the pain? You know what they said? The pain's gone. And you know what they say afterwards? But it might come back. Yeah. I'm like, hey, you know what you've just done? You just opened the door to the enemy to bring that pain back. People who are bound by alcohol get set free, get delivered. They know they're free. But how many people know you've got to go home and pour down the booze down the sink at home? Say so amen, someone. You know, you're drinking whiskey. How many people know if you're having whiskey in the morning, you've got a drink problem? All right, if you're doing, you know how many times in this in our community we see people first in the morning, you know, as we're having breakfast, they're having cider, rum, and whiskey and gin. They have a problem. Well, you've got to have, if you want to be delivered, you've got to pour it down. You've got to pour it down the drain. Pastor, I believe I'm delivered by, uh, from cigarettes and smoking drugs. Great, but when you go home, don't keep them because they're worth money for a later time. No, you've got to rip them up. You've got to throw them in the bin. You've got to chuck them away. Don't bless someone else with your drugs. Yes. Don't give it to someone else. No, flush it down the toilet. And if you're having problems doing stuff like that, call me and I'll help you. You see what we do? We say that we're delivered. We say we want to be set free. But unless we're aggressive in the follow-up action, yes. unless we take action yes. to back up the promises of God, we never receive them. See, many people are waiting for God to move, yes. and God's waiting for you to move. Yes, yes, yes. You know, the road, the first right, if you come up our building, turn left, first right is called Frank Road. And they now have paid parking there uh, during the day. Well, before that, the cars used to park on both sides. And it was a horrible road. How many of you here are drivers? How many of you here drive a car? If you drive a car, okay. If you've ever been down Frank Road a year or two ago, it was a nightmare. There'd be one car coming, another car coming. There's cars parked on both sides. There's only space for one car. No one wants to pull. And I can't tell you how many times I've driven around the corner and I've seen the roadblock. And I remember one time <laughs> uh, I got stuck in that road and there was a car in front of me. There's a car coming up. And I'm like, I'm beeping my horn. No one's moving. So I jumped out of the car. And I went to the lady in front of me and said, you know, would you move? She goes, no, she needs to move. And she wouldn't listen to me. So I went to the other lady and said, hey, you know, there's a lot of cars there, there's a lot of cars behind you, would you move? She goes, no, she needs to move. You see, both of them are waiting for each other to move. And I wonder sometimes whether it's like that with us and God. You know, you're waiting for God to move and God's waiting for you to move. Come on. See, God's already done his part. See, God's done his bit. And it's time for us to move in response. See, in every one of God's promises... There's going to be opposing spirits that must be overcome. These demonic forces and spirits resist God's promises. So what I mean by that, if, uh, if God has a promise of healing for you, you need to know there's a demon of sickness. You need to know that for every one of God's promises, there are demons specifically designed and developed and raised up to resist that promise. If you have a, uh, if, if you are, if you have a promise of, of being fruitful, of having children in marriage and in family, you need to know there's a demon of barrenness. There's a demon who specializes in opposing fruitfulness. Likewise, if you understand that God wants you to be uh, liberal and generous and to tithe and to give offerings, you need to know there's a demon of poverty. Come on. There's a demon of covetousness. There's a demon of greed. That's going to oppose the promises of God. And the only way you can be able to overcome it is through prayer and being aggressive in your faith. Yeah. You've got to be aggressive in your faith if you're going to receive what God has. You've got to learn to cast out demons. Someone needs to cast out demons. And some people don't believe it's true. I'm going to tell you that I've cast out demons before. 
And sometimes there's spirits in your family life. There's, there's spirits, you know. Um, maybe there's a child that's always, uh, something's not always right with that child. You know, you need to cast that demon out. You need to cast that spirit out in Jesus' name. You need to lay hands on it and cast it out. You know, when you move into a new place, I don't see people do this as often as they used to. But I remember when I got saved, whenever, when any time someone moved into a new flat, a new house, all the brothers and sisters would go into their house and cast out the spirits in the house. Be laying hands on the wall, because you have no idea what happened in the house before you moved in. All sorts of nastiness and, and wickedness and evil. See, we cast out spirits. We cast out demons. Why? Because great is he that is in me than he that is in the world. You've got to fight. Because there's an opposing spirit that must be overcome. The spirit of man, the spirit of covetousness, the spirit of poverty has to be resisted. It has, it has to be cast out and cast down from your family life. If there is poverty, if you are living a life of poverty, I want to tell you that it's spiritual. I know sometimes it can be practical, you've got to make good decisions, but I want to tell you oftentimes it's spiritual and you've got to cast that spirit out. You've got to cast out the spirit of sickness from your children. Pastor, my children are always sick. We need to cast out that spirit. Pastor, my kids can't sleep at night. The women are always having nightmares. They're struggling at school and in this. Well, cast that spirit out. Take faith, lay hands on your children, lay hands on your family, and be aggressive in your faith. So you've got to understand the spiritual realm. Ephesians 6.12 says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. See, in the Old Testament, they wrestled against me. They fought against each other. In the New Testament, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. In other words, people are not the problem. Flesh and blood is not the problem. But we wrestle against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. You see, in the Old Testament, the Bible says, God trains my hands for war. You know, David couldn't build the temple of God. Why? Because he killed so many people. You see, you see David going out with a sling to fight the lion and cutting off his head. You see them engaged in physical warfare, but in the New Testament, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against spirits and principalities of evil and darkness. You see, in the Old Testament, we might have to teach you how to physically fight. You might be walking around with a sword, with a helmet, with a breastplate, with a shield. You might be walking around with armor and weapons and physical weapons. Well, in the New Testament, guess what you need? You need to know how to pray. You need to know how to cast out demons. You need to know how to read the Bible. You need to know how to recognize the promises of God and rely on the promises of God and claim the promises of God. Why? Because the weapons of our warfare uh, are not our physical. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, against the rulers of this dark age, uh, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. You need to learn how to fight spiritually. This is why prayer is so important. If you're not praying on a regular basis, if you're not sharing your faith on a regular basis, if you're not coming to church, if you're not witnessing, giving, tithing, if you're not praying for the sick, and I'm not saying about praying for the sick and expecting them to recover in six weeks' time. No, you pray for the sick and you're expecting an instantaneous response. You're expecting the pain to leave right now. If you're not aggressive in your faith, you won't win and you won't have the victory in this Christian life. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. The word wrestle means to fight, yeah. to struggle, to grapple. Can I tell you now, poverty is a spirit. You know what most people think poverty is? People think poverty is a lack of money. Mm. <laughs> uh, I wonder how many people here today, you've ever prayed a prayer to God, almost. You've ever wished to God, you say, you know what God, I wish I could win the lottery. Or I wish my aunt that I never knew, uh, when she passed away, she'd give me a billion pounds. Lord, I don't want a lot of money. I don't want to win a thousand, a billion pounds. And I don't, you know, just give me a little something, a little million pounds. Did anyone here ever pray that prayer or wish that to God before? Or was it just me? Because you mistakenly think that money is the answer to poverty. Well, I want to say to you that when poverty is in a person's life, it's a spiritual problem. Poverty operates in a person's life because they make wrong choices about God and about money. And how do I know this? Examine every lottery winner who has won the lottery in the last 20, 30 years. 
what happens, what happens to most of them within a few years? They're bankrupt. They lose it all. There was one guy, uh, I can't remember his name for the life of me. I can remember, I can see his face. He had a gold in, big gold chain, big sovereigns. Does that ring a bell in anyone's uh, mind? And he won the lottery and uh, I think he won six or seven million pounds. He went out, had a good time, lost it all, had to go back to work. You should go and read his testimony. He says, I wish I never won the money. Winning that money was the worst thing that ever happened to me. I want to say the guy's name is Mark something. It's, uh, it's in my memory. See, we understand that how many people, how many people know that if you win six million pounds, you're not poor anymore? Come on. See, it's a spirit. Yes. It's a spirit. Ask Mark Tyson. Four hundred million dollars he earned in his fight career. Do you know that Mike Tyson is making a comeback? He's doing exhibition rock. He's going to do an exhibition match with uh, Roy Jones Jr. You know why he's doing it? Because he needs the money. He needs the money. Because poverty is a spirit. And you can give someone who has a spirit of poverty a lot of money, but just give it time and that money will disappear. See, people with a poverty spirit consistently make wrong choices. How many people know that oftentimes the cheapest option is not always the best option? You know, I was talking to someone the other day on social media and I was asking for recommendations and I saw something that was cheap and I put it up there in this group that I'm in. You know what someone sent me a message on um, Facebook? They said, the poor man pays twice. Yes. Yes. That hit me like a ton of bricks. That because we've got, a, you know, a pot, you know, we want the cheapest thing. And poverty, you end up paying more than what you should pay. Why? Because it's a spirit. It's a spirit. Prosperity is the opposite. Prosperity is also a spirit. You know, someone when you're prospered, how many you know Joseph was prospered? Even when he was in prison, he was being prospered by God. Even when he was a slave, he was being prospered by God. Why? Because prosperity is a spirit that goes with you. It's a spirit that helps us make right decisions about God and money, not based on our circumstances, not based upon the world's opinion, but based upon the word of God. Faith is believing and acting upon God's word. Deuteronomy 11, 24. Every place on which the sole of your feet treads shall be yours. That was God's promise to Joshua. God says to Joshua, wherever you go, wherever you put your foot down, that shall be yours. Wherever you step, that shall be yours. How many people know Joshua still had to go and fight for it? Yeah. He still had to go into those lands and battle the inhabitants. You see, prosperity is a spirit that makes right decisions. It's a spirit that, uh, that looks to God's word, that claims the promises of God. You see, so many decisions we make in life should not be based upon money, but the will of God. You know, there are people that won't do certain things for God because they're afraid of the financial sacrifice they have to make. You know, there are people that aren't here tonight, you know why they're working. I talk to people every week, Pastor, I'd love to come to church, but I'm working. And I'm like, working on Sunday? Tell your boss you can't work. Ah, oh, boss, I don't want to do that. I don't want to jeopardize my job. Well, you know what you're doing? You're making your boss your provider rather than God making him your Jehovah Jireh. You're giving your boss too much authority. You're giving them too much influence. You're not trusting God. And sometimes you have to say no to money in order to say yes to God. You've got to be aggressive. You've got to understand the spiritual realm. You've got to understand there is a spirit of poverty that follows some people in their families. Likewise, there's a spirit of prosperity that follows some people in their families. And I can tell you now, the one that I want and the one that I know is upon my family is a spirit of prosperity. Yes, amen. There is a spirit of prosperity. And prosperity doesn't just mean you get more money. How do you know we can be prospered in so many different ways? Yes. Uh, you know, the other day I had the privilege of taking my daughter to collect her A-level results and many of you would know about the fiasco in this country surrounding A-level results that I think up to a third or 40% of all A-level students, the high-end ones, were marked down a couple of marks. How many people knew about that? Just wave your hand if you heard about that. Okay. 
And so, you know, I went to her school with her, you know, I was a bit tense, you know. The parents had to stand outside while the, while the students went in, and you know, the parents are out there waiting. It was a bit of a confusing time, you know, because no one was really happy. A lot of people were confused, they were looking at their grades, you can see them looking, shouting to each other, what's going on. And so my daughter comes out with her grades, and actually her grades were below what she expected. But on the way to picking up her grades, she was also trying to get onto the university website to see whether she'd been accepted. And it's almost like as soon as she got her grades physically, the university messaged her and said, congratulations, we're now going to offer you your place at university. Come on, someone, give your praise for that. And so these are, she got her first choice. Now you got your first choice. You said, she got her first choice even though her grades were not what she expected. So we're all excited. Yes, amen. Her head teacher calls me today. <laughs> Says, can I speak to uh, Liana? I said, I'm going to say his, her name is Liana, but you know, maybe now's the time to correct her head teacher. <laughs> and so uh, he's talking and he says, well, actually, because you haven't known the government of the u turn yeah. they've now increased the grades. So one of her grades, I hope not just saying this, was a B, and that's now being increased to an A. I'm like, you know what, God, you're so good. Yes, amen. Because what might have happened is that she might not have got the place because her grades originally were not good enough. And then she had several days of anxiety before he got with her. But see, God took care of her in the very beginning. Yes, amen. He says, way before the government. In other words, I don't want you to thank the government for your grades. So I'm going to take care of you. Amen. You've already been prosperous. Come on, someone stay into that. You see, I believe that's a family blessing. That's what I'm telling you. Amen. I believe that's a family blessing. Again, I don't want to, um, you know, uh, embarrass her, say too much about her business. Well, all of a sudden, I found out that she gave a special offering before her results came in. She didn't talk to me about it. I didn't even notice that. I didn't know about it. That she gave an offering of her own back into the offering. And several days later, her results come in, not what she expected. Don't write about it. The first choice university have accepted you. Then later on, we might pray to do your grades what they should have been anyway. That's not an accident. Come on. That's not an accident. You see, when I took my exams, I wasn't saved. <laughs> I failed all my exams. You know, I failed, you know. You don't know what rejection's like till you get a new. Anybody ever got a new? <laughs> You know, you've got to look it up on them. What does this mean? <laughs> I'm explained. You know? <laughs> and so, uh, glory to God. Well, that's a blessing of God. So that's the spirit of prosperity. You know what God's favour is? God's favour is that, you know the Bible says, surely goodness and mercy yes, shall yes. follow me all the days of my life. Oh, See, that's the favour of God. <laughs> See, that's the spirit of prosperity. See, it's God who gives us the power to get wealth. God makes it possible for you and I to be financially blessed. You see, when we take God seriously, when we're aggressive with our faith, when we obey God's word, God gets involved in our situation. He inspires us to make right decisions. Seriously, I, had, I was shocked by it. I had no idea she put a special offering in. She did it off her own back. So as a teenager, she's already understanding the spiritual realm. Is it the money that God wants? No. It's the obedience, it's the faith. It's the faith that God wants. It's the, it's the, you know, that offering was the physical evidence of her invisible faith. Faith without works is dead. She has faith, but she has works and actions which prove her faith. You see, all the promises of God must be aggressively claimed by faith. You've got to do something. You've got to, you, you, you know, we spoke about our worship being accurate, effective, authentic, and active. Your faith must be active. You can't just say, I believe in my head. But where's the evidence in your private life? Where's the evidence? Pastor, I believe. Show me. Show me the proof. Well, I just told you. No, words are cheap. It's actions that speak louder than words. You have to take God at his word. And say, you know what, this is mine. I claim, I've worked for this, I put the effort in, but I know God's going to be with me, God's going to help me, God's going to give me favor, and this is the promise of God, and I, and I claim this, and I claim this in Jesus' name. I claim my healing, I claim my children's deliverance, my kids are flopping at school. Well, I rebuke that spirit in Jesus' name. 
The dogs have said this about someone. Well, I rebuke that spirit in Jesus' name. And we aggressively and actively and assertively claim the promise of God in this situation. I'm going to get a pay rise. I believe that in Jesus' name. You've got to claim that I'm going to get a new job, a better job, a righteous job with righteous hours. Well, you've got to actively claim that in Jesus' name. Let me close real quick. If you do not tithe, you have released a financial curse into your circumstances and given the enemy access to devour your resources. If you're not tithing, you know what you've done? You just left the door open. You know what you've done? It's like the person you prayed for and the pain's gone, but they said the pain might come back. It's like you've handed the keys to the enemy. You said, enemy, you know, come and devour. Come and take my stuff. Uh, come and uh, give me unexpected bills. Uh, you know, cause my car to break down. Uh, let the gas ball make a mistake with my bill. They've undercharged me. Then they've realized they've overcharged. You know, could be problems with my council tax. Uh, give me, you know, devil, come and devour whatever it is I have. But see, when you tithe, come on, someone. When you tithe, how many people know God rebukes the devour for our sakes? Come on, someone. Isn't that a promise of God? Don't you believe that? Amen. In other words, when those bills are coming your way, you know what God does? He gets his tennis racket and he backs them away. You know, there's all sorts of things that should have come our way we didn't even know about because God dealt with them before they came to us. God dealt with them. God is trying to help us and bless us. But we cannot violate God's word and expect to be blessed. This is true of every day of our lives. Maybe you would say, you know what, Pastor, I haven't been a tither, but now I'm going to be a tither from today. Today I make up my mind. Today, Lord, I'm going to have aggressive faith. Aggressively, I'm going to tithe. Aggressively. Um, it doesn't matter what happens. Uh, my roof could fall in. My car could break down. Uh, whatever can happen my way. Get unexpected bills. Uh, no excuses, Lord. I'm going to be aggressive in my faith. I'm going to put you first. And I'm going to begin to tithe from today. Maybe you're someone here today. Today, your situation is sometimes you tithe, sometimes you don't. You're inconsistent. Well, maybe today you'd say, you know what, I'm going to be consistent and faithful, aggressively. And you know what happens when you aggressively do something over time? It's nothing to you. It becomes nothing. <laughs> Seriously, I stopped thinking about my tithe 15, 20 years ago. I just do it automatically. I just faithfully give it. It's, it's not a sacrifice. In fact, if I don't tithe, I feel bad about it. It's like, man, I don't want to... I don't want no problem with my blessings, I need to honor God. See, this will bring a peace of mind to your life. See, some of you, when it comes to money, you've had money worries. You've read about money, you haven't had financial peace for a long time. How many people know peace of mind is a wonderful gift of oh, God? Come on. To have peace of mind. Hallelujah. Not having to worry, just to trust God and put everything in His hands. See, if you are struggling financially, you need to be a good steward, you need to have a budget, you need to work yourself, get out of debt, etc, etc. But a part of your stewardship strategy, you must aggressively claim God's promises and exercise power and authority of the enemy. The devil wants you poor. God wants you blessed. But your decisions must cooperate with the will of God. How many people know God wants us to be healthy? Mm. Would, would you agree with that? Raise your hand if you believe God wants us all to be healthy. Yeah. All right, how many people know we've got to make decisions that cooperate with that, with that desire? How many people know that means we can't have KFC breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day? Yeah. How many people know that means we can't be chucking alcohol down the back of our throats and smoking cigarettes and smoking drugs? Yeah. Can someone say amen? amen? You know, isn't it a bit difficult to be a smoker and a drinker and then you get a sickness that's caused? You know, the other day I went to the doctor for, a, for some blood tests to check. You know what she asked me? Guess what she asked me? The first few questions. Do you smoke and do you drink? Yeah, yeah. And you know what? And I'm watching her, and I've been, actually it's a new doctor, I don't think I've met her before. And I know where she's going with this, and I'm looking at her, and I'm like, no, I don't smoke. And she's asking me, when last did you smoke? And I said, I've never smoked. You know what's happening in her mind? She's writing off any sort of test that has to do with smoking yeah, and chest yeah, yeah. testing. She asked me, did I drink twice? She asked me in a slightly different way. She asked, first of all, she asked me, do I drink? I said, no. She then asked me a second time, roughly how many units do I have per week? I'm like, do you hear what I said the first time? I don't drink. I've been drunk since I was in my early 20s, maybe when I was 21, if that. 
You see, even doctors, in other words, I want to be healthy, you want to be healthy, but how do you know we've got to make decisions that cooperate with the will of God? You can't be smoking and drinking and living a horrible lifestyle and you get sitting and God, oh, why am I sick? God's like, because Pastor told you to be healthy and you don't want to be healthy. We've got to make decisions that cooperate with the will of God. And if you're struggling financially, that's not God's plan for your life. If you are gripped in a spirit of poverty, that's not God's plan for your life. God wants you to be free from poverty. God wants you to have financial freedom. God wants you to be blessed. But you've got to be aggressive in your faith. Can you say amen to that? Can we give the Lord a big round of applause? Can we give him a big round of applause?